Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The IMF this week urged government, business and labour in South Africa to craft a new bargain to stimulate high levels of economic growth. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the call. Hi Terence. What exactly did the IMF's David Lipton say in his address? Well, he gave a broad-ranging address around the global economic situation, the situation in Africa, and then he narrowed it down to South Africa and the situation that we're in. And basically said, globally, we know we're still in a vulnerable place. The world's not going to grow much better than 3.3% this year. That's the IMF forecast. And there are a lot of risks are still in Europe. And there are slow, uh, slower growth in places like India and China than we've seen previously. He was much more optimistic that the robustness of the sub-Saharan African story remains even though there are a number of external vulnerabilities to, to sub-Saharan Africa's growth, there's a number of uh, indicators that it's, it's fairly resilient and it is that the region, and uh, apart from South Africa, is going to grow uh, quite well at above plus 5% over the next few years. So that's a good part of the story. On the South African uh, aspect of the story, it was a little bit less uh, optimistic and it was really about a subdued growth outlook. <coughs> and, you know, the IMF has this view, this latest update, which came with the, new, the meetings in uh, Washington, the spring meetings, was that they'd be really in a three-speed recovery as a world. So we've got the, uh, the first growing emerging markets like uh, um, um, sub-Saharan Africa, China still being quite strong. Then you've got America recovering stronger than it has been, uh, mostly led by its private sector. And then you've got uh, um, Europe, which is really still stagnating and still struggling to break out of the Great Recession. But he, he indicated that maybe the analysis should be a four-speed type recovery, because there are economies such as South Africa, also mentioned Brazil, that are struggling to break through in terms of uh, the, the getting to higher levels of economic growth. So while Sub-Saharan Africa is growing strongly, South Africa's outlook for this year is below three and next year only just slightly above three percent, which is nowhere near the sort of levels we need to start creating the jobs to make a dent on that terrible figure that we saw last week of 25 percent plus on the narrow definition of unemployment, not even the broad definition. So there's millions of people out of work. One of his main points was that, yes, there are external factors that are constraining growth in South Africa, Europe being a major one because it's a key export market and the fact that there's not enough demand for our products. Even in places like China, there's been a slowdown, so therefore it hits the commodities. But uh, he's saying that uh, there's also some tailwinds in the sense that we, our proximity to sub-Saharan Africa is a tailwind and offers us an opportunity for some growth. And uh, the, the other thing is that we really need to start looking at internal drivers of growth so that we can't really, we need to buffer ourselves from the external vulnerabilities uh, in the way we manage our, our fiscal and monetary policies. But we also need to look at levers, internal levers, uh, for uh, uh, igniting higher levels of economic growth. These levels are just not sustainable for the way our economy is currently. And one of the levers he suggests is a, a social compact or a, what he called a broad bargain between government, business and labour that comes together around a framework of what he describes again as invest, invest, invest. So government should invest in creating the, the conducive environment for the private sector to, to invest more and for uh, growth to be realized, particularly dealing with backlogs around infrastructure, education, health, etc. Government must invest in the sense of being more future oriented, not only looking at um, or the wage season, the immediate wage season and those demands, but looking at the competitiveness of South African labour force, looking at the productivity and maybe uh, making some sort of compromises around flexibility. And business must be much more prepared to invest the monies that, that are currently sitting on the sidelines, basically because of a lack of confidence and a lack of sort of visibility of the future, both internally and externally. What is the likelihood of such a compact or bargain emerging in the coming months? It's difficult to know whether the political will is there within each of the different power blocks um, to get behind a social compact. I think for government it makes sense and I think really leading the charge is 
First, the publication of the National Development Plan, which provides a framework for a social dialogue. And then the uh, finance minister starting to get that integrated into the budgetary processes. And then the finance minister making calls as well. Let's have more dialogue. Let's look at how we can work together. Let's not focus on our narrow differences around the plan, but rather on what areas that we agree on and what we can act together on. So the, the government, it's definitely in their interest to pursue the plan. Business, I think, again, it's probably in business's interest to pursue the plan um, or to pursue a so some sort of social compact. One, to just get a more labor piece at the shop floor, at the mine, the rock face. Um, so to, to you know have a more common purpose approach to the way we produce uh, goods. On the other hand, there's some vulnerabilities because our product markets are quite concentrated and government, as part of this compact, is going to say, you know, if we even have sniff any of this anti-competitive behavior or this cartel behavior, we're really going to have to come down hard. There's a lot of talk about whether there should be a greater sanction and more criminalization around cartel behavior and real criminal behavior by the, the corporate sector. So there's some risk there. But again, I think very much in the interest of business to come together. Where it's, where it's a bit unclear at the moment is around the labor factor, the la la labor faction within that social um, uh, grouping. Because I think labor is quite divided at the moment. Kasatu, the main union movement, has got its own internal strife at the moment. We're going into serious wage bargaining season in the mines and in uh, certain industry sectors. And, uh, you know, that's really about more of an adversarial time. And so it's going to be difficult for them, at the one hand, to be very adversarial, and on the other hand, to come uh, into some sort of social compromise, which is really what this broad bargain will be. So in the context of uh, what we really do need a bargain, it seems, I think even Labour would agree we need a, a different bargain. But in the current context, where we're heading into some serious difficult wage, wage negotiation season. And there's also these other proxy battles that are being fought. And unfortunately, the National Development Plan has become the, uh, the framework around which a lot of these proxy battles are being fought. Um, it is going to be a, a, a tall order, but I, I think it is the right call. How we get there and whether we can get there is another question altogether. What are the potential risks for South Africa not meeting its structural constraints? Yes, and I think that's the key. We've got serious structural constraints at the moment. This unemployment rate is now stuck b above 20, 25% for some time now. And this youth unemployment issue of uh, one in two so that young South Africans between 15 and 24 are being out of work and really not having a prospect of work because really the education system hasn't done much justice to a lot of these individuals. So the skills are not matched to the needs of the co corporate sector or even to the government or e any formal sector. We've got serious structural problems here. And then we've also got the issue of income inequality, which has not improved. Uh, it's actually worsened over the last uh, couple of decades. So there's serious structural issues that South Africa has to deal with, or we face serious social um, unrest and social you know, what, again, Zeland Vimvavi's term of the time bombs. The time bombs are there and they're ticking. And, you know, unless we start addressing these structural uh, issues to the economy, David Lipton mentioned it, that there is, uh, there's definitely grounds for social unrest, which is never good for, for business and never good for growth. And uh, it's, but he's not alone. Vavi, Zeland Vimvavi is saying it. I think government acknowledges that the triple curse of poverty, unemployment, and inequality has to be dealt with. The issue is that we, we can't, it can't be just business as usual. Therefore, we need to have some sort of uh, way of coming together and building consensus around a common program. It, we seem to be very far away from that point, but it is in our DNA, because if you look back to uh, the 1994 settlement and the, the very difficult path to that settlement, it looked very rough. And then right up to the elections, it looked very rough, but we continued with social dialogue, we continued with social partnerships, we continued to make compromises and make uh, sensible decisions on putting South Africa first. We're not quite in that phase where people, I think, are selfless and ready to give up as much as they did in 94, but we need to recapture some of that spirit and enter some sort of bargain, I think, so that we can navigate 
what's going to be a difficult world for some time. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.